let's talk about this new mobilization of 500,000 soldiers that Zelensky is talking about. In your opinion, is it going to change anything on the battlefield? I think these are acts of desperation, uh, political de desperation as well as real desperation, political on the part of Zelensky, who sees his power fading and his prospects fading, and uh, a delusion on the part of uh, anyone who is associated with it militarily, because I think unless you're prepared to put a rifle or a machine gun or whatever in the hands of every single citizen of Ukraine, regardless of their training or whatever, um, it's nonsense. And even if you're prepared to do that, it's nonsense because all you're going to do is get them killed. You're probably going to kill a few Russians in the process, but you're going to get a whole lot more of your people killed than you do Russians. And if I were Vladimir Putin, I would just sit back and, and watch it happen and, and, and not take any real action about it except to continue to talk to the other powers, principally Washington, about neg negotiations, about diplomacy. He's made it quite clear that he's ready to talk. Um, Lavrov has made it right, very clear that he's ready to talk. Biden has even sort of played around with the idea. By, you never know with Biden, he doesn't seem to be able to follow a train of thought for very long. Um, I, I used to think that was political with him because that way he never got pinned down. And I know, and I know it was his technique when he was a senator. But as president, you can't have that technique consistently. Um, people began to question you. People all over the world began to question you. So he's got to get a solid line going here, and we've got to start talking. And if Zelensky's in the way, we've got to talk around him. Um, we got to stop this conflict. Uh, Ukraine is going nowhere but down, worse and worse every day. Um, and Russia, I think, re recognizes that. We're, we're looking at a Russia. The sanctions have not damaged her very badly. Uh, sanctions like we've applied them to Russia, rarely do. Um, so I just don't see that there's any productivity in going ahead. I don't see that there's any possibility of Ukraine changing the situation. And contrarily, I do see that the situation could get much worse. I don't think anybody in the Ukrainian government is probably on the same page with Zelensky right now, because you'd have to be, you'd almost have to be an abject fool or insane not to see what's happening and not to see that in the scheme of things, you've lost um, the people in his immediate entourage who might look, lose power when he loses power are probably talking in different voices. That's the way it happens when you're at the end of your tether. That's the way it was with the Germans at the end of World War II. That's the way it was with the Japanese at the end of World War II. That's the way it is almost always with a losing power. I think these are measures of desperation, political desperation. Uh, he wants to stay president and also real desperation in terms of the war. Um, I just don't see how Ukraine could come up with 500,000 capable, trainable um, new soldiers overnight or even in a month or two. Um, it's If you want to put 60-year-olds in the field or 70-year-olds in the field or whatever, five-year-olds in the field, but that's nonsense. It, I think they're measures of desperation. I think he's uh, running out of options. Points that Putin made in his recent press conference, I found it so amazing and constructive. He said Russia is willing to rebuild its relations with the United States. That's a huge statement after 19 months of war in Ukraine. You know, I was just cleaning out some boxes of, uh, of papers I brought out of the State Department and out of the chairmanship of General Powell when he was chairman. And one of the things I found was a treasure trove that Brent Scowcroft National Security Advisor to George H.W. Bush, um, gave Powell that Powell gave me um, after we finished using it. It's um, it's speeches by Shevardnadze, Edvard Shevardnadze. It's speeches by Mikhail Gorbachev. It's papers by Shevardnadze, where Shevardnadze actually sat down and wrote a paper for Jim Baker, the Secretary of State of the United States. And he would, he would um, imagine things and write about where Shevard Nazi was. I wrote on one of his papers, I said uh, to, to the chairman, I said, General Powell, you need to read this. This guy's extraordinary. I could see why Gorbachev was attracted to him. All these ideas that they had, uh, all these uh, 
fresh shoots, if you will, of, of things that could be done, possibilities, um, future, uh, Russia back in Europe, Russia a member of the military council of NATO, Russia a member of the political council of NATO, Russia a functioning uh, entity, a democracy. You know, you go back and you read those sorts of things and you realize how much damage Bill Clinton and the people after him did to what could have been a very positive relationship. And you cannot ferret out a single reason why they did that other than there were many of them that were linked with people like Larry Summers, Anatoly Chubai, and others who really wanted to fleece Russia and take all the money they could out of the fire sales that they did for the oligarchs when the oligarchs saw, oh my God, look at all this communist-owned stuff going for a song. Yeah, we'll pay your fees to negotiate this. And all of that money and filthy lucre actually corrupted the people who were dealing with it. And then you had people like Hillary Clinton and Madeleine Albright and others who I think just hate Russia, just despise Russia, um, never could live with Russia, never could you know say that a Russian might be a good person. And, and all of that, and I'm looking at this that's in the boxes and I'm looking at today and I'm saying, how in the hell did we let that opportunity escape us? No, Larry, it's worse than that. We compelled that opportunity to escape us. Well, what you just said is Putin still sees some of that opportunity. How do you see the roots of this type of hatred? What type of ideology is behind this hatred, in your opinion? If you scrape hard at the average American, you'll find much of it is ignorance. Much of it is ignorance that tells them I need to be fearful of that because I'm unknowing of it. And and my best approach to it is to be fearful of it. And therefore, I'm going to vote for this guy who says, you know, he's going to bring a hammer down on Moscow. That's the biggest problem. Uh, I'll bet you you could count on your toes and your fingers how many Americans who aren't derivative of Russia speak Russian <laughs> or even give a damn about speaking Russian. Um, you then have the other problem, and I think this is the problem at work with what I call the corporate oligarchy, the deep state, and that is they're constantly looking at something they can make money off in the way of an enemy. And they're looking at first, and this just makes sense, someone who is not terribly formidable, but has the potential to be. And in this case, you've got someone who was and suddenly reduced in power significantly, still got their nuclear weapons though. Um, and they're looking at someone who could regenerate the kind of money-making deal they had for half a century with the Cold War. And they see China and they see Russia. China, because it's now risen up to the point where it can compete with us on almost every level, and Russia, because, oh, they always were horrible. Plus, there's this ignorance, as I described. So that's it. Money and ignorance. And, you know, if you want to pick two words to describe an American, money and ignorance. Do you see any willingness in the Biden administration to go after negotiations? Or we have to see who's going to be the next president of the U.S. to see what's going to be their policy on you. You may have just said the magic phrase there. We may have to wait and see what's going to happen in 2024 uh, before we get anyone who is really willing to go out on a limb and, and, and actually not really going out on a limb so far to do the positive thing. And when you talk about Odessa, you know, I go back to Alan First. I don't know if you've ever read any of Alan First books, but he's a tremendous historian in addition to being a fiction writer. He's probably a better historian than most historians I know. Um, and Odessa has a long history. Odessa would probably be better if it were a city-state out in the ocean. <laughs> it is probably one of the criminal capitals of the world. It thrives on and lives on crime. And if you talk to anyone of any um, persuasion, and there are all manner of persuasions in Odessa, you'll you'll find that they recognize that. It, it's almost like the Cosa Nostra in Sicily. Um, and I know a little bit about that anyway. 
I don't know why anyone other than the port facilities and the structure of the city itself, the surrounding area, I don't know why anyone would want the problems of Odessa in terms of management and rule, democratic or authoritarian. Um, would What would I do if I could do? I would take a pair of scissors and cut it off and put it in the ocean and make it a city-state and tell it to behave. Very, very entrepreneurial people, very sharp people, but usually they use their entrepreneurship and their entrepreneurial qualities and their skills and talents for other than legitimate activities. <laughs> so they're going to hate me for saying this. Odessans are going to hate me for saying this. No, they won't. They're just like the Cosa Nostra. They understand what I'm saying. Um, but it does have some strategic aspects to it, just as does Crimea. And there's another problem. The very first thing that our diplomat, whomever, president, has to say to Russia is, we recognize your sovereignty over Crimea. We will not challenge that. Oh, by the way, on the way out the door, if you could recognize Kosovo, that'd be nice. You know, tit for tat, blah, blah. Crimea is a lot more important than Kosovo, but uh, would you do that? Um, Odessa is a different matter, though. I, o Odessa, to me, if I were in Kiev, uh, Odessa would be hard to give up. I've said what I said about I would willingly give it up if 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 I had my druthers, but I wouldn't if I were in Kiev. I'd make that probably as uh, 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 that without which I will not finish the negotiations, probably, if I were in Kiev. Now, if it's the United States and it comes down to Odessa or continued war, maybe going even worse for Ukraine or Odessa and no war, I don't know. I'm, I might try to work out some kind of arrangement whereby Russia and Ukraine shared sovereignty uh, for a while until maybe you could have the citizens of Odessa vote on which way they wanted to go. And very, very carefully, because you might be surprised by the results, especially if the war winds down and it's about 10 years before you have the referendum. Um, Ukraine, Odessa might wind up being the most difficult thing in the long run. It might be the most difficult aspect of the negotiation. Ukraine joining NATO would be on the table or off the table? Not anyway. One of the first things I would say, in addition to recognizing Russia's sovereignty over Crimea, is Ukraine will never be a member of NATO. And you know what? Because we cheated the Russians so badly when H.W. Bush's promises and Baker's promises to Shevardnadze and Gorbachev were violated, I would say, to, if I were Putin, I would say, put that in writing. Put that in writing. And if you have to put it through your Senate for ratification, because that's your process to be solid and true to your promises, do it or I'm out of here. I wouldn't trust this if I were Putin. The Ukrainian foreign minister says that Europe doesn't know how to fight. In your opinion, what else Europe can do for Ukraine? I think it can do a lot for Ukraine if we get this stopped. I think we can wind up with a Ukraine that's neutral. A Ukraine that retains, as Finland did when it stood up to the Soviet Union, most of its territory. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about Russian intentions with regard to Odessa and that general region in particular. I, I don't know. I, I have a pretty good idea of how, if I were Secretary of State, I would frame the negotiations with Putin. Um, and I'm not sure how I would deal with Odessa. That's the only unknown in there. I don't, I'd have to listen to the Russians and see what they're, you know, we can't do without Odessa or some kind of control over it. Um, but otherwise, I think the outlines of a deal, so to speak, are right there. And Ukraine keeps its sovereignty. It's neutral. It's not going to be a NATO member. It, uh, its rehabilitation is going to be the challenge going to be the tremendous challenge. And you're going to find that Zelensky's right about the Europeans when he starts asking them for money for that rehabilitation. Um, Germany's going to be reluctant. France is going to be reluctant. The United States is going to be reluctant. We've got a 33 plus trillion dollar aggregate debt hanging over our heads now. Um, but that's, the, that's going to be the big challenge. But that's a challenge that doesn't kill people. 
it's not a bombs, bullets, and bayonets and, you know, potential for even wider conflict. It's getting the conflict over and dealing with Ukraine's rehabilitation and establishment as a neutral power in a key area between the CSTO on the one side, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, and NATO on the other side, though I don't think NATO is long for the world. I don't think the CSTO probably is either. They've got a real problem with some of the southern tier states. And you've also got to deal with the the situation that the EU itself doesn't seem to be able to deal with. And that's getting its political act together so that the economic promise that the EU had, I mean, its GDP was the equivalent of, of the United States, $22, $23 trillion, 740 million Europeans. Um, and, and it can't get its political act to get together to the point. You've got the Italians again talking about reverting to the lira. You've got others who are looking at Brexit and saying maybe that wasn't such a bad deal. Um, so this is not a time to be playing games with wars. It's, it's a time to get your political act together. And I keep coming back to those two humongous challenges that we all have. We need some sort of condominium of power. We do not need alliances. We need a condominium of, of powers. And th that condominium has to be has to be Beijing, Moscow, Washington, probably Tokyo, probably Berlin, probably Brasilia, and, and, and others as they want to come in. And it needs to deal with two threats that outweigh everything else confronting us. And that is the climate crisis, which even here in my climb in my state of Virginia is becoming very noticeable, especially in terms of the heat um, and the drought. Um, and we need to deal with nuclear weapons. This condominium needs to deal with proliferation and stop it cold in its tracks. And it needs to deal with the nine nuclear weapon states that already exist and get them into a treaty regime, which begins to reduce these stockpiles not increase them, which is what we're looking at. When you look at the Antony Blinken's policy in Ukraine, why he's so insisting in sending more weapons, more funds to Ukraine? I want to say that they're just incompetent, but I can't say that because I know there are other ulterior motives that all of them have. Their political motives, their money motives. Blinken let the cat out of the bag the other day when he said, why should we worry about what's happening the way people say we should? Because, look, we don't have any blood committed at all, and we're making a lot of money. I think that is a major admission on the part of this team. That's what they like. They're making a lot of money, and they don't have any American blood committed to it. For that matter, they don't have any NATO blood committed to it. They just have Ukrainian blood. That's, that, that, that's a horrible formulation, but you're seeing the same sort of thing from Blinken and Sullivan with regard to Gaza. You're seeing the same sort of cold-hearted realpolitik that is realpolitik only on the surface. It's stupidity underneath. And I don't understand it. I simply do not understand it. I said to someone the other day, four billion people in the world now despise the United States of America. No question about it. It grows by another 100,000 to a quarter million every day that Gaza goes on. Terrorists are growing every day that Gaza goes on. Every terrorist group in the world is watching this. Every terrorist group in the world is wondering if it can gain the capabilities to attack the great Satan, as we were called by the mullahs in Tehran. Um, this is not a way to do business in the world. And yet, Blinken, Sullivan, Newland, Clinton before them, Hillary in particular, and her war in Libya, all seem bound and determined to do this sort of thing. They, they seem bound and determined to use the United States military to bash people around the world, not periodically, but almost every year. We've got troops still in Iraq. They have no business being there. We've got troops still in Syria. They have absolutely no business being there. They're there against international law. The established leader of Syria has not asked them to be on his territory. We have troops all over the world. We have them in the Sahel of Africa fomenting coup from one end of the Sahel to the other. 
why are we doing this? I do not understand. Uh, it, it's either utter incompetence on the behalf of the Biden administration, which a lot of my friends and colleagues from the old days, so to speak, are telling me it is, or there's some really pernicious motivations underneath this administration that are more than political. And I'm not so sure that that's not got some reality to it, too. It's just not making any sense to me. I mean, when John Mearsheimer talks about realpolitik and, and uh, what it's like for a rising power and, and a status quo power, that's one thing. That's political science. This isn't political science. This is criminal, in my view. This is criminal. Our support for Gaza and for Israel right now is criminal. It's clearly criminal to half the world perhaps more as time goes by, if we don't stop it. I don't understand it. I don't understand why we are sacrificing years and years. We're sacrificing everything that I did in my 31 years in the military. Um, we're sacrificing what everyone has done since World War II and before that, to build a, a state that has its problems. It commits crimes from, now, uh, from time to time, but basically I thought was a pretty good state. I am having a hard time believing that any longer. And Biden and this administration and the administrations before him ever since 9-11 actually have led me to believe that we're going very far afield of our original purpose, of our original founding fathers design for us. Biden and Blinken talk about democracy. They wouldn't know democracy if it hit them in the face. They don't know what democracy means. Democracy means the people. The people, demos, the people, the people haven't had any say in this country in one way or the other since 9-11, arguably to a certain extent before. The, the country's being run by corporate oligarchs. The deep state is there. It isn't a fiction of anyone's imagination. We're being run off the cliff by it. And we have presidents who pontificate and platitude that's it. Biden and his platitudes, his platitudes about Gaza really make me ill. And Blinken's too, and Sullivan's too. And Sullivan's admission, admission, outright admission by saying that the Middle East wasn't even in his inbox until October the 7th. Jake, are you the dumbest person on the face of the earth? Anybody who knew that area, knew that situation, knew what the Israelis were doing in the West Bank, knew what they were doing in East Jerusalem, knew what they were doing to their own citizens inside Israel, treating them as third and fourth class citizens if they were Arabs. Anybody that knew that knew this was a powder keg. And here's Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor for the president of the United States, saying it wasn't in his inbox. Well, where were you, Jake? Nobody understands why the Biden administration is totally on the right side when it comes to Israel, ignoring all those people who are from the center, from the left, who are opposing this kind of policies. That's an excellent question. It's what I ask myself almost every week. Um, ever, in fact, ever since he snubbed an American president from the Congress of the United States, Barack Obama, by speaking to that Congress over the head of the President of the United States and by taking the applause of the people in that Congress who knew, he knew damn well were vehemently opposed to that black man in the Oval Office, most of them Republicans, if not all of them. Ever since that, I've known just how subservient U.S. presidents are to this guy. I mean, he speaks English, so they understand him. But what the heck is going on here that this criminal, that's what he is, he's a criminal, has got the United, the United States and all of its leadership in his back pocket. And apparently, as you intimated with your comments about uh, anti-Semitism in the universities and treating people as if they're pariahs when they criticize killing in Gaza at the proportions, uh, at the proportions that is happening right now, it's just sheer nonsense. It's, it's like your Orwell didn't go far enough. It's like this is insanity. This is crazy that this kind of thing exists. The flagship, the flagship, the paragon of American journalism, 
which is in the Israeli camp lock, stock, and barrel, the New York Times, finally said two days ago, and I'm going to quote it, some of Israel's allies and even former Israeli officials are growing more skeptical that it will be impossible to completely eliminate Hamas. Do you think? <laughs> you think? Yeah. That's the New York Times. They are so pro-Israel, it's pitiful. But th at least they said that. Then they went on to say, nearly 2 million people in Gaza are sheltering in the south. But bombing has continued there, including in areas where people were told to move. No joke. What does that tell you? That tells you that their intent their intent, unlike Halevi, the chief of the general staff of the Israeli Armed Forces, said, this is the most moral force in the world, says Netanyahu. And Halevi says, we'll do whatever we want to do, talking like he's from Washington, not Jerusalem. We'll drop 2,000 pound bombs on these guys and we'll kill them left and right. The Pope, the Pope has to come out and say, Pope Francis said, that sniper, that idea of sniper who shot that woman and her child was a terrorist, right, Pope Francis? And so are those people dropping those 2,000 pound bombs. They're cowards. They are cowards in airplanes. They are dropping bombs on people they know are women and children and UN workers and hospital staff and doctors and nurses. It's preposterous. And yet what you say is true. We sit back and throw platitudes at it and act as if, it's, you know, okay, the banality of the evil will be evil with you. You know, I thought Biden was picking up and picking up a little steam and was bringing some hammers down with Netanyahu. But of late, it looks to me like they're perfectly, perfectly okay with him going on through January and maybe into February doing what he's doing with, with everyone knowing that his clear intent is to kill every Palestinian he can get his hands on to kill. Terry, Netanyahu believes that widening military actions in Gaza is the only way to free hostages and destroy Hamas. How do you find this statement? I find it nonsense. I think it masks. It's become his ostensible purpose. I want to get Hamas. I want to get Hamas. I want to eradicate Hamas. Well, first of all, you're not going to eradicate Hamas. Here's, here's an idea for you. You don't eradicate a terrorist group with bombs, bullets, and bayonets. You don't eradicate an ideology with anything but an idea, an idea that's more powerful, more sellable, more marketable, more attractive. I want to say more humanitarian even. You don't defeat it with anything but another idea, a better idea. Guess what Bibi Netanyahu has done with the idea that would defeat them, democracy. He's destroyed it. He's destroyed Israel as a democracy. So he's taken that quiver, that era, out of his quiver, the only era that would ultimately defeat Hamas, democracy, and he's defeated it himself. And now he's saying he's going to defeat Hamas. Well, you're not. You're not. I tell you, you're not, because you threw your idea away. You've thrown it away. Who was it that said it was um, uh, Barack, I think, said the other day, this man, Netanyahu, has a criminal convicted in an Israeli court of being a terrorist as his director of security, Ben Gavir. He's right. But then let's look at it from the very top. Netanyahu's a criminal himself. Do you see anybody in Israel standing against Netanyahu or his administration? Do we know any political movement in Israel capable of doing that? I'm increasingly seeing things coming from the press in Israel. I, I, I have to admit that the press, due to Sheldon Adelson's buying it all up for Netanyahu, is mostly Netanyahu press, with the exception, major exception of Haaretz. But what I'm seeing is the press reporting that more and more as days go by, the Israeli bulk of the Israeli people are for this. They they want Netanyahu to eradicate the Palestinians. Um, him saying, I, I, when he said the other day that the idea that the Palestinians didn't have any place to live, that they could live in Israel, that Palestinians, Arabs were already living in Israel as citizens. I'm on a, I'm on a, 
every other Sunday, I'm on a simulation and there are Knesset members on there, there are Palestinians on there, there are Israelis on there, there are professors, there are scholars, all manner of people. People who know the history of Israel, people who know the history of Palestine, people who know the Balfour Agreement, people who know all these details. And you, you go on these things and you say, okay, is it pretty clear to me that they're third and fourth class citizens? that the Jews in Israel hate the Palestinians who are citizens in Israel. They just threw one of them out of the Knesset. They just threw her out because she criticized the war. Uh, can you imagine, even in the depraved state of my country, America, the U.S. Congress throwing someone out because they criticized the U.S. in a war? <laughs> that wouldn't happen, I'm sorry. But they threw her out. So Israel is a preposterous situation right now with Netanyahu at the helm. But I must add, coming back to your question, it seems that the bulk of, his, of Israeli citizens, Jewish Israeli citizens, are for him. When it comes to understanding to the impressions that the U.S. has from the Arab states, do they have any clear understanding of what's going on in these Arab states? Probably not. There are a few people at the State Department. There are a few people in the other bureaucratic uh, reaches of our government. There are quite a few people in our universities, uh, scholars and others, who understand the Arab world fairly well. You can't really understand, in my view, and I've had a lot of time, almost 80 years, to develop this view, another people, another country, another state, another region, unless you speak their language. And not just, you know, to say, hey, goodbye, hello, give me something to eat. I mean, really understand their language and their, their history and the history of that language, whether it's Farsi or Arabic or Hindu or whatever, Urdu, whatever it may be. And we have very few people like that in our country. Um, in America, there are scholars and professors and others, a very narrow margin of people who are this versed, I found it at I, uh, INR, at State, the intelligence entity at the State Department, far more so than at the CIA or any other aspect of our intelligence apparatus. Scholars, people who really know the regions, really know what's going on. That's why INR was one of the few intelligence apparatuses in the United States that got Iraq right in WMD. Um, we don't have those kind of people. We just do not have those kind of people. So. To answer your question directly, Morocco, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, there are very few people who know what's going on there. We are fortunate right now in one respect, but he's so malpositioned that I, I worry about it every day. William Burns, the director of the CIA, should be the secretary of state, not the director of the CIA. You're seeing him be used for all kinds of things that Blinken ought to be used for. But it's Bill Burns doing it because Bill Burns is 10 times the man Anthony Blinken is in terms of diplomacy. Uh, but he's malpositioned. But he's one of the few people whom I could answer your question with a positive and say, yes, Bill Burns does know these regions. He does know the people. Um, he's been amongst them. He understands them. Um, it, he's the kind of diplomat like Sergio Vieira de Mello, who was probably the best diplomat I ever met in my life. Um, walk in a Khmer Rouge camp all by himself and start negotiations. Um, he's that sort of a person. Um, but we don't have many of those, unfortunately. And America has about one a century. How about Soviet Union? In those days, there was studies on Soviet Union. It doesn't exist right now about Russia. You talk about Bill Burns, the director of CIA. It seems to me that he has nothing to do with the U.S. foreign policy right now. Unfortunately, it's a, a, a part of the fabric of our bureaucracy that the CIA director does not get involved in that sort of thing. It's almost a, a, a rule. Um, they're using him for things because they're desperate because they realize how void they are of any kind of skill or talent in that respect. And so they're using him from everything from hostage negotiations to, um, well, I can't talk about some of the things, but he's been involved in a lot of things that a secretary of state would be involved in normally. It's, it's a particular time in our history where our power is waning 
And in the past, we have been able to use brute power in order to get through situations that other states would get through with exquisite diplomacy, with really smart people operating on the periphery and in the center, at the top and in the middle. France comes to mind. Um, frustrating country sometimes, but it's diplomats know what they're doing when they're doing it normally. Um, we just aren't that way. We bullied our way through the 20th century. We, we became the new Rome in 1945, and we continued to bully our way. We had a big power over there with nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union, as you indicated, that was able to check our more, shall we say, uh, native or wild interest. We don't have that anymore. We have an array of powers out there, and they're about to check us, if not already having done so, um, by forming alliances and taking care of us. Um, and anybody that can't see that that's happening is really smoking some low-grade stuff because it is happening. And we're doing it to ourselves, just as Netanyahu has destroyed democracy in Israel. Israel is not a democracy. And Bibi Netanyahu put the coup de gras to that democracy. He destroyed it. And he's doing it even in its grave right now. Israel will not be a state in the next two decades. I guarantee you that. And Bibi Netanyahu will be the person who put the stake in the in the heart of the werewolf. Um, I don't know where we're going in the bigger sense of things, because as I said, we've got to get together and cooperate and collaborate in order to save the human race from nuclear weapons and from the climate crisis. And people who still tell me, who say things to me like, when the water's up around my chest, Larry, I'll be with you. Or they'll say things like, um, well, you know, probably if nuclear weapons proliferated across about 30 countries, we'd have a safer world. I admit there's an academic argument there, but it's an academic argument that scares the bejesus out of me because I know what human beings are like. I've spent my life amongst human beings the last 12 years at the highest levels of power in the superpower of the world. And I know what happens when idiots get in charge of some of these things, and we have a plethora of idiots. So I'm scared. I'm frightened for the human race. And not me. I'm going to die. I'm not going to be here to see this. But my kids are and my grandkids are. And I know that the climate crisis is coming down the railroad track at us like a freight train with full speed up. The Arctic is going in a much faster, much faster, uh, almost four to five times as fast as the rest of the globe with regard to the feedback loops of the impact that the climate change, climate change has. I wouldn't be surprised within the next 10 years, maybe I will still be alive to see this, that we will have a sea level rise that is going to be so consequential that many coastal areas will have to be evacuated, that we'll wind up having to relocate. Um, adaptation won't be sufficient. You won't be able to build walls. You won't be able to do this, do that. Um, if it takes that, okay, fine. It takes that, then we'll get to work. But I'm worried that even with that, we won't get to work because you can't do it alone. Washington can't do it by itself. Beijing can't do it by itself. Moscow can't. Berlin can't. You all have to work together. This, this is a moment, as one person said to me the other day, it is true that we have the technology, the skill to save ourselves. But... I'm really worried about the wisdom. I'm really worried that we don't have the wisdom to use that technology and to use what we know about what's happening to us and the planet and the climate to save ourselves. The planet, planet isn't worried. The planet will burn out in the sun in four and a half billion years or whatever it is, um, and we won't be here. We simply won't be here. Or a very, very modest number of us will be here starting all over again. Um, that's not a prospect that I relish. 
uh, it's not a prospect, as I said, I relish for my grandchildren or even my children who live another 30, 40 years, probably. My grandchildren will probably live another 60 years. Um, they're going to see it. They're going to see the very height and depth and profundity of this crisis, and it is going to be profound. Um, and they're going to look at me and generations around me as being irresponsible, selfish, cruel, brutal, fighting wars in Gaza that kill thousands of people while we should be trying to save the human race, while we should be trying to do something about nuclear weapons. No, we're fighting wars in Gaza. We're fighting wars in Ukraine. We're fighting wars in East Africa. We're fighting wars in the Red Sea. We're fighting wars all over the world. We're fighting wars instead of cooperating and doing what we have to do to save the human race. That, that, that may sound panglossian. It may sound like, uh, well, okay, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about because humans will never get around to that. Well, I'm sorry. If they don't, they are done. They're toast. They're finished. Do you think at the end of the day, this type of tensions between Netanyahu and Arab nations, between Netanyahu and Turkey, would help Israel? He's desperate, he's crude, and he's brutal. That's all I can say. And the comparison, while it might seem to resonate, is not quite the same. If you go back and look at what Turkey, not just Erdogan, Turkey, and the Turkish Armed Forces have done to the Kurds. And you look at what they've done to the Kurds in Southeast Turkey, and you look at what politically as well as killing some of them. You look at what they've done to the Kurds in Iraq and Syria and Iran. It doesn't even come close to what Netanyahu is now doing in Gaza. Nothing on earth comes close to what Netanyahu is doing in Gaza, which is what makes me so angry with my own government throwing platitudes and softballs at this man who is becoming the greatest murderer in the 21st century. No question about it. And women and children. Um, Saddam Hussein didn't do as badly as Netanyahu is doing in Gaza when he went up there and used chemicals on people in his own country. Um, let's you know, th this is not apples and oranges. This is, this is a very, very bad comparison by Bibi Netanyahu. I mean, Erdogan's got his problems, no question about it, but I would not trade Bibi Netanyahu for Erdogan. Bibi is rapidly making himself the worst person in the first half of the 21st century in terms of war crimes, in terms of killing innocent civilians, in terms of not caring about it, in terms of making it his purpose, in terms of being uh, an individual who vouchsafes to the world that it's his purpose. I mean, he's not even trying to propagandize it. He's saying, I am going to exterminate Hamas by exterminating the Palestinians amongst whom they operate and live. That's essentially what he's saying. And so are his generals. And so is his director of security, who is right now in the West Bank killing more settlers and trying to stir up another war on that front. And why are they doing this? Why are they trying to stir up a war with Hezbollah? And why are they trying to stir up a war with Syria or on the border at least? And why are they doing things that piss El Sisi off in Cairo? Why are they doing that? Because they want to drag their big daddy in to bash Iran. That's why. Bibi is looking to expand this war to make it regional and to bring the United States in as his savior and fix everything in one fell swoop. And I got news for him. He's going to find out the United States will get so mired down and so stuck in a place like Iran that he'll have damaged the entire region for a century. And remember what I said about the climate crisis and about nuclear weapons? We'll probably use them. I don't have any fear of Putin using a nuclear weapon first. I have a very, very profound fear of Washington using a nuclear weapon.
if they want to defeat Hamas, do you think going along with two-state solution wouldn't be much smarter than going in Gaza and killing the civilians? Absolutely. If the Palestinians had a state, a state that was economically viable, a state that was roughly peaceful, a state that looked a lot like Israel in terms of territory, a state to which Palestinians could return, a state that was more or less shaped by the uh, 242 resolution and the one that followed it, I forget the number, but the, um, the borders of the uh, borders before the 67 war. If the Palestinians had that, what the hell would they need Hamas for? And Hamas would have its uh, have the carpet pulled out from under it. You would also pull the carpet out from a lot of other people in the region. You would probably begin to damage the Iranian effort to export through the Quds Force its philosophy throughout the region, which is being challenged now even by the Iraqis. I mean, they're not doing a a, a, a really bang up job about it, but they are challenging it because they're getting tired. They they know they need Iran. They know they need the commerce. They know they need them in the south in particular around Basra and that area. But they also know that they can't consolidate their state, if you will, as corrupt as some of them are, unless they, you know, give Iran some notice that they don't own everything in Iraq anytime they want to own it. So they're getting increasingly angry at the Iranians for what they're doing with the militias in Iraq. And at the same time, they aren't that comfortable with our residual presence in Iraq. And I wouldn't be comfortable if I were they either. Um, so we're we're stirring up these things still. We're, we're still with our presence, we're causing problems. And people say, well, you know, we don't have many, many troops in the, in the Middle East. I, as I've said to you before, we have more combat power in the Middle East than anywhere else. And look at what's happening. The strategic cockpit of competition, if you will, in that region is shifting from the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea. And it's shifting there. Actually, it shifted there probably five to seven years ago. It shifted as the Somali pirates drew military power into that area, into the Bab el-Mandeb and that area, in order to deal with what they were doing, the predation they were affecting on shipping. Shipping and rates were going up, insurance was going up. We put a combined joint task force in there. We had all kinds of countries uh, cooperating in it, and we dealt with that problem. And so the problem receded a little bit. And then all of a, all of a sudden came the Houthis and came the war with Yemen, started by no other than the Minister of Defense of Saudi Arabia, who is now the Prince Mohammed bin Salman. I mean, he wanted to get his marker on the ground as a great warrior, and he started this debacle in Yemen. Now we're paying for that because now we have the terrible situation in South Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, on that side of the sea. On the other sea, we have the war in Yemen and we have people going back and forth and we have 60%, I'm told, of the world's commerce going up through there, headed for the Suez. Now prices are going to start skyrocketing and inflation is going to go off the charts probably if we don't do something about it because people are going away. Shippers will not do that. We did a simulation of this about 2009 in Beijing, and the Chinese were stunned when we showed them what would happen if we suddenly had places like the Malacca Straits, uh, the Bab el Mandeb, the Strait of Hormuz, less so, but other places where narrow confines for ships to go through were suddenly, we postulated terrorists, were suddenly hit with terrorists. We took down a big tanker in the Strait of Malacca. We took down Ras Tanura, the, uh, what was it, uh, 3 million barrel per day, I think, production capacity in Saudi Arabia. All of a sudden, insurers wouldn't insure, shippers wouldn't ship, and the price of oil went from $80 a barrel to $300 a barrel overnight in the simulation. Chinese learned some things from that, I think. We started having to shift oil around the world. We had to send Alaska North, Shore, North Slope oil to Korea. We had to send some oil that was coming out of the uh, Iran and the Gulf. We had to send it to China. We had to monkey with the whole distribution network. Well, that's what we're talking about now with the Red Sea if we don't get this in, under control. 
We should slap a combined joint task force there immediately. It should have the Chinese, the Japanese, the Turks. It should have everybody that has an interest in that region. There are seven countries in Djibouti right now, I'm, I'm told. Um, we should have a combined joint task force that's powerful and doing what navies should do, keeping these people from disturbing the commerce of the world, because that, that bothers us all. <laughs> that affects us all. The prices of things in Europe, the prices of things in North America, indeed all over the world, are going to be affected if we don't do something about that situation in the Red Sea. And where did this come from? Well, it's being exacerbated by, guess what? The war in Gaza, <laughs> of course. So, you know, just take yourself a marker, a grease marker, and get yourself a map of the Levant and, 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 and uh, contiguous areas and go, whoop, we're going to have a big war pretty soon, a big war. And there's going to be all kinds of players in there. And guess what? The United States has not got the combat power to deal with that. Neither does China. In fact, I don't think anyone does. So maybe that's maybe maybe I'm pipe dreaming here that maybe that's what maybe that combined joint task force will grow into a combined force that will become ultimately a peacekeeping force. I don't know. But I do know that we need to fix ourselves on something that is really important. And the Red Sea is far more important than the Persian Gulf, which we seem to be fixated with um, and get get a handle on it. And Gaza is contributing to this. Gaza is stirring up the entire region. And well, it should when you sit back looking at people being killed at the rate they're being killed and the way they're being killed. <music>